how do cells in our brain work together to endow us the ability to have thoughts and feelings, to have preferences and superstitions, to have personalities and dynamic relationships? How do we know our place in the world and how to behave within it? Tonight, I want to give you a window into how the brain and its communication systems give rise to some of the most consequential experiences of our entire lives. But first, who am I? I'm the daughter of a physicist and a biologist who literally met on the boat to America in pursuit of an education. Here are my parents graduating from MIT at their PhD hooding ceremony. So, since there was, of course, no pressure at all to become a scientist. Here I am uh, at my ceremony about 30 years later. This is my graduation from MIT. And as a college student, I had to decide whether I would focus on psychology, the study of the mind, or neuroscience, the study of the brain. I chose neuroscience because I wanted to understand how the mind is born out of biological tissue. But now I've come full circle to do both, and my research is bridging the gap between the mind and the brain. Your brain creates all facets of your mind, and as a graduate student in neuroscience, I was told that you can't study how internal states like anxiety or craving or loneliness are represented by the brain. So I set out to do exactly that. In my research, I investigate the mind by understanding brain circuits. Specifically, how does our brain give rise to emotion and features of emotion, such as how positive or negative something is to us? This feature is called emotional valence. Emotional valence drives motivated behaviors, which fall into two general classes. Seeking pleasure, such as eating a delicious treat, or Avoiding pain, like when you are hungry. Emotional valence also applies to social interactions. Being at a birthday party can be remarkably pleasurable, while being shunned and teased can be one of the most painful experiences. In both animals and people, it is hard to study feelings and emotions because they can't be quantified. Behavior is still the best and only window into the emotional experience of another. However, technology has opened new windows into the black box that is our minds. In the last decade, the development of new tools has allowed us unprecedented control over specific neurons in the brain and how they talk to each other by firing electrical signals. We can genetically engineer neurons to be light sensitive and use light to control how neurons fire with precision. This technology is called optogenetics. We can then see what happens to the animal's behavior, giving us insight into what that neural circuit can do. With help from my colleagues, I pioneered the use of optogenetic tools to selectively target neurons living in point A sending their messages down wires to point B, leaving neighboring neurons going other places unaffected. This approach allowed us to specifically test the function of each wire within the tangled mess that is our brain. Let me show you an example of how we can change the activity in specific neural circuits to change specific aspects of behavior. Because of our interest in compulsive eating disorders, we wanted to explore a neural circuit that could be responsible for feeding behavior. To identify the neural circuits for feeding behavior, we have here a fully fed mouse exploring a space that is completely devoid of food. Here, we are about to use optogenetics to target neurons in a brain area called the hypothalamus, sending signals to another area called the midbrain. When I turn the light on right here, indicated by the blue text on the bottom, you can see that he immediately begins licking the floor. This seemingly frenzied behavior soon escalates into something I think is pretty remarkable. Okay. This incredible part's coming up right here. Boom, there it is. The mouse picks up its hands as if it is holding a piece of food but no food is present. 
That means that this circuit is sufficient to drive feeding behavior in the absence of hunger, even in the absence of food. While I can't know exactly how this mouse was feeling, I speculate these neurons can drive craving based on our ability to measure the compulsive overeating that mice do when we stimulate this pathway in the presence of food. When I turn the light off, as I've just done, indicated by the white text on the bottom, you can see he's back to normal. Given my deep interest in motivated behaviors and emotions, it would be impossible not to consider social factors. In our daily lives, one of the biggest impacts on our emotions involves social interactions. Species that live in social groups can be incredibly successful. Social species find interactions rewarding and isolation aversive. Our social environments changed dramatically between 2019 and 2020. In 2020, anxiety and depression skyrocketed, with 70% citing um, social isolation as a primary reason. Social isolation, or even perceived loneliness, correlates with a shortened lifespan, mood disorders, cancer, heart disease, and inflammation. But we don't know how. There is an urgent need to understand the biology of loneliness and our drive to socialize. In mice, we have actually discovered a group of neurons that is activated when an animal is in a loneliness-like state. We used optogenetics to activate this brain circuit in a mouse and then observed its behavior. We discovered that when a mouse is placed in a box with two separate chambers, the mouse will avoid the side of the chamber that was associated with activation of these neurons. The fact that the mouse avoids this chamber indicates that the activation of this loneliness-like brain circuit is unpleasant. But when we gave a mouse an opportunity to socialize with another mouse and we activated this circuit, it creates a pro-social effect, whereby the mouse approaches and socializes with the other mouse more. At first, we were confused with these results. How does activating a brain region produce a pro-social effect but also cause a negative emotional experience? We therefore looked to another scientific field for an explanation, feeding. In particular, hunger. Hunger is a negative experience. And what do we do when we want to get rid of hunger? We eat. This is the same for the loneliness system. Loneliness is a negative experience, and what do we do to get rid of it? We socialize. If a mouse were with its social group, then this neural circuit would be silent. If that mouse were separated, these neurons would start to activate, causing the mouse to feel a loneliness-like state, driving it to go in search of its social group. When the mouse is reunited with the social group, these neurons stop firing. This is the first time that someone has discovered a neural circuit for loneliness. Not only did we find this circuit in mice, but we have actually have evidence now that a similar circuit exists in humans. We are all looking forward to some sort of post-pandemic world. Unfortunately, before that, we have to recognize that we are in another public health crisis, a mental health crisis. To help tackle this crisis, we need to truly understand that it is cells in our brain and their multitude of connections that are the source of emotions, personalities, desires, and perceptions. With this understanding in hand, we can help eliminate the negative perceptions and stigmas that prevent many people from seeking the mental health support they need. We will be able to improve the lives of everyone who suffers from a mental illness at some point in their lifetime. This is half the population as well as the lives of everyone else with whom they share the world. And with that, I would like to thank the Blavatnik Family Foundation and the New York Academy of Sciences for their support of science and young scientists like myself. I would also like to thank my family, my mentors, and especially my research team, my students, postdocs, and staff without whom none of this would have been possible. Thank you.